We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for this day. We're thankful for the blessing that it is to be in your house. And we're thankful for the Christmas season. This is why we're here, because Jesus came. This is why we have hope, because Jesus came. And this is why we have the promise of heaven, because Jesus came. Lord, thank you so much for that hope and that promise, for the wonder and glory of this season. Although the year has been a difficult one, Jesus still came, he still saves, and he's still coming again. We're so thankful for that hope. Lord, bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're glad that you're here today, and we want to welcome you to, uh, to church. And we normally have a packed house on Christmas Sunday before Christmas, but obviously circumstances are different. We're thankful for those that are joining us on the stream this morning. And that ministry is going well, and we're glad that people who can't be here because of the health risk are able to watch us on the stream. So we're so glad to welcome them as well. There's really no announcements per se, but we do have one bit of information. Up here on the communion table is a list, a phone directory. And I found out I made a mistake on one of them that's been handwritten, but I'll get a clean copy uh, back next week and, and keep them up here. That's a phone directory for the for the resident members in the church. Uh, it, I only put no more than two numbers on the line. I mean, some of these, some households got four and five numbers with all the cell phones and things. I only put no more than two numbers on a line. If your number's not correct, I think it is because I usually call most of you at one point or another. So if your number's not correct, let me know. But uh, I want you to pick one of those up and have it. That's not. This is not everybody that comes to our church. It's not the entire membership. It's just those that, have, that attend fairly regular or faithfully within the last year or so. And these are people you can contact. And my idea is I think we ought to call one another and wish each other a Merry Christmas. So uh, if, even if you don't want to do that, you got their numbers if you need to borrow something from them. So there you go. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the reason for that. If you didn't get one yet, they're up here and you can pick one up or we can pass them out later. But please make sure you avail yourself to that and you can, it'll help you uh, to get a hold of your church family, your, your fellow church members. Um, just real quickly, prayer concerns. Is anyone you'd like to mention this morning for prayer? Steve, let me say him real quick. Steve is home from the hospital. Uh, his surgery went good. He still has further treatments for the cancer, and he's having some other issues. But we're glad Steve's home, and we're praying for uh, for he and Tammy. Uh, who? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Briar broke her arm. Okay. Here. Okay. Who else? Here. I'm sorry. Okay. Here. All right. Who else? Here. Okay. Anyone else? Here. Yes. Yes. Here. Okay. All right. Did we have a very good week this week or not? Okay. Amen. 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 We want to continue to pray for that. Anyone else? Here. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Any other? Your dad is? Okay. Anyone else? Amen. All right, join me as we pray. Father, we thank you that we can come together today to pray for one another. And Lord, one of the greatest gifts you gave us besides salvation is you allow us to talk to you. And we can talk to you anytime, anyplace, anywhere, about anything. And Lord, we have people on our hearts and minds today that are sick, that are suffering, that are hurting, that are downhearted and discouraged. People are just tired, Lord, because of all the things that have been going on. But Lord, we know that you have said in your word that we can cast our cares upon you. We know that you said that you'll take our burden and you'll carry it for us. So Lord, I pray that you would do that today. As we lay out our requests and our petitions and our concerns to you, you already know what they are. You know how they're going to turn out. 
but we turn to you, Lord, for strength and for help and for guidance. God, thank you that we can worship in this Christmas season. Lord, this is one of the most important times of the year, not just for family and friends, but for our faith. It's what we believe. It's what we stand on. And I thank you, Lord, that Jesus was born. I thank you that he lived, he died, and he rose again. And because of that, the angels continue to sing. Lord, thank you for the day of worship. We pray for our nation. We pray for our church. We pray for our community and our families. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Every year I read the Christmas story. And I ask you to read it along with me. So if you have a Bible, would you find Luke chapter 2? Luke chapter 2. The second chapter of Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 2. And when you found that, would you stand in honor of God's word? And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went out to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in that same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all that they had heard it wondered at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Merry Christmas. You may be seated. This morning, my daughter has worked diligently on a Christmas present for you. And it's a difficult song to sing, but Katie's going to rise to the occasion. And uh, tonight, this morning, Katie's going to sing O Holy Night as a Christmas present for our church. So 
My turn. <laughs> wow, good job. Good job. Merry Christmas, everybody. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. If you have Luke 2, say amen. I've already read the text, so I'm going to go right into the message. This morning, I want to ask a question. <clears throat> why is Christmas special? I don't know how you feel, but I feel like there's a different feeling about Christmas. There's something different about this holiday. And I'm not talking about this particular Christmas, this particular year. This, this year is different in every way. But I'm talking about in general, Christmas is a different holiday. You ask any child, I would dare say 99% of them whose family celebrates Christmas, you'd say to them, what is your favorite holiday? And I would say 99% of kids would say Christmas. To be honest with you, if I took a poll in here, I bet a lot of you would say as adults that your favorite holiday is Christmas as well. Christmas decorations, Christmas music, Christmas get-togethers, 
Christmas clothes, ugly Christmas sweaters. Just different. It's special. But Christmas is special for a lot of reasons, and I think a lot of people don't understand why it really is special. See, Christmas is not just a secular holiday. Christmas is a theological day. It's a theological holiday. When you and I say Merry Christmas, and by the way, I say Merry Christmas. When you and I say Merry Christmas, we're making a theological statement. We're saying there very boldly and very plainly and very clearly, Be happy, Jesus is born. Be happy. Jesus is born. But see, this is where the story gets a little bit more complicated and a lot of people don't understand. Because the only place in the Bible where you find the story of Jesus' birth is Luke 2. Matthew gives a genealogy. Mark doesn't even touch it. And John uses that great majestic opening. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the only thing he says that even refers to Jesus' birth is that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Luke's the only place where you're going to find the actual narrative of the birth of Christ. What happened that day? But the story starts before then. You may not know this. It may not have been something that's ever occurred to you, and I want to explain it to you. The Christmas story actually starts in Genesis. Now you say, how does that work? Well, you know, God created this world, and he made everything in it, and the last thing he made was man, and then he made woman to be his helpmeet. And then all of a sudden, man fell into sin. And when you come to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God gives us what his remedy is going to be for the sin problem that man created. He said, one day there's going to be one come, and he's going to take on this serpent, and the serpent's going to bruise this man's heel, but this man's going to crush the serpent's head. And Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 is the very first promise that we have in the Bible. The very first book of the Bible, three chapters deep. The very first promise we have in the Bible that a Savior's coming. It's not Luke 2. It's not Matthew 1. Not any of the Gospels. The very first indication, the very first promise that we have that a Savior is on the way it's found in the very first book. Then you read Genesis chapter 4, and it's an amazing thing because, you know, uh, Adam and Eve, they come together as man and wife. They're evicted from the garden. And then, and then Eve has a baby, and she thinks that baby is the man that God has promised. She thinks the Savior's already born. She says, oh, I've got a man from the Lord, she says. Little does she know that it'll be thousands and years before the actual real Savior, the Savior, will be born. Adam's ruined, Adam's ruined race will continue in sin for millennia. As a matter of fact, it will get so bad that God will go silent. His glory will leave the temple in the book of Ezekiel, and then we'll get to the intertestamental period, that, by, that one blank page in your Bible between the Old and New Testament where God goes silent for 400 years. But then God says, I'm going to speak, and I'm going to speak in my most dramatic way. In a way like I've never spoken before. Yes, I spoke at the beginning and said, let there be light and light was. And let there be the earth and the, and the heavens and the stars. And all those came to pass. But never ever in history has God spoken in the way he spoke in the New Testament. When he said, I'm going to speak through my son. I'm going to send my son to be born on the earth. Here's an amazing thing about Christmas. It'd be a great place for an amen. Jesus knew he would have to die, but he still came. See, this is why people don't understand that Christmas is important. That baby laying in a manger wouldn't one day be a lamb on a cross. He didn't have to do that. But he did. You know, a gift is something that someone gives you that they don't have to. A wage is something that you earn. A credit is something that's delivered to you on basis of your reputation. But a gift is a totally different situation. See, my friend, a gift is something that someone gives to you that you don't maybe not even deserve. Sometimes you ask for it, sometimes you don't. But out of their own graciousness and out of their love and out of their, their affection for you, they give you a gift. The greatest gift that you and I have ever received 
is that Jesus came. Jesus came. It's prophesied through all the Old Testament. Isaiah said that one day a virgin will conceive and shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel and he shall save his people from their sins. Emmanuel, God with us. Paul takes all of this and wraps it up in a beautiful package and puts a bow on it. And the Apostle Paul says these words, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, believed on in the world, and taken up into heaven. It's the story of Jesus. He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, believed on in the world taken up into heaven. It's a Christmas story from beginning to end. We use big words, big theological words. Incarnation. That just means that God came in the flesh. The virgin birth. That means that Jesus did not come into this world like sinful man did. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. We use those big theological words to explain what Christmas means. And so many people don't understand why it's special. Well, can I show you just one thing? Look at Matthew chapter 1 with me. Just take your Bible and look at Matthew chapter 1. It's the very first book of the New Testament. If you have Matthew 1, say amen. Amen. Now, Matthew 1 is the genealogy of Jesus. It actually begins with the mention of Jesus and talks about being the son of David. And we go through many of the Old Testament characters. One of the fascinating things about Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 is it has non-Jews in it and it has women in it. Women don't normally appear in genealogies and non-Jews don't normally appear in genealogies. But you've got a Moabite in this genealogy. You have, you have non-Jews in this genealogy. But, but, but what I want to show you is something very fascinating because if you look at all of the genealogy records here, and I'm not going to read all these long, hard Old Testament Hebrew names for you, but if you get to verse 16, it changes. All the other verses before this says so-and-so beget so-and-so, and so-and-so beget so-and-so. But when you get to verse 16 and it says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. It does not say that Joseph begat Jesus. Do you know why it doesn't say Joseph begat Jesus? Because Joseph was not his father. God is his father. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse uh, 35, I believe it is. Excuse me. Wrong verse. Verse 19. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a public example, minded to put her away privately. And while he thought on these things, behold, an angel appeared unto him in in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not, take Mary for thy wife, for that which is conceived of her... In her is of the Holy Ghost. Now look up here at me. I want you to get this. Everybody look at me. Everybody in this building look at me. The reason Jesus is different than Muhammad and Buddha and everybody else, Jesus was not born through a sinful seed. Jesus was virgin born. Now this is important. You need to get this. Jesus did not come into this world through the conception of a man and a woman. God through the person of the Holy Spirit, put Jesus into Mary's womb. He's not all man. He's man and God. He doesn't have the original sin that we had. If Jesus would have sinned even one bit, if Jesus would have had one drop, even one drop of sinful seed in him, he would not be the Savior. 
He would not be able to die for our sins. He would not be able to carry the penalty of the cross for what you and I have done. But he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He was virgin born. And listen to me, if you don't believe this, you're not saved. He never sinned because he's Savior. He never sinned. That precious little baby, born of a virgin's womb, came into this world perfect. And he left this world perfect. And he'll come back again perfect. Now, I want to preach Luke 2 for just a few minutes. And I want to take you through this just for a second. And I want you to just, just try, to, try to take this home with you. Number one. Look at verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And they all went out to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Do you notice something strange about verse 1? Something very strange. Look at it again. Something very strange about verse 1. Caesar Augustus evidently believes that he's the ruler of the world. He, he doesn't just believe he's the ruler of, a Ro, of the Roman Empire. He doesn't just believe he's the ruler of the Judean province. He believes he's the ruler of the world. A decree went out from Caesar Augustus, the governor, the emperor, that all the world should be taxed. This guy has become so brash and so bold and so arrogant in his thinking that he thinks he runs the world. All the world shall be taxed. So he decides, I'm in charge of all these things. I'm the Caesar. So I'm going to tax the entire world. What a bold, brash, arrogant statement for him to make that he has charge over the entire world. I want to try to keep this Christmas this morning, but I got to say this and I want everybody to hear it. These people in office, I'm going to be careful. These people in office that think they're in charge, they're not in charge. God's in charge. He decides what happens to this world. I got news for you. This Jesus that you and I celebrate that was born in a manger, he sits on a throne today. And he's in charge of this world. He decides what becomes of it. He decides how long it lasts. He decides how it goes. He's in charge. So Caesar gets this arrogance about him. I'm going to be in charge and I'm going to tax the whole world. Now look at verse 3. And all went to be taxed. And by the way, something else I'll get an amen on. I never have liked paying taxes of you. Well, get ready. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea and into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he's of the house and lineage of David. How many of you in your Bible, that's in parentheses, is of the house and lineage of David? Is it in your parentheses in your Bible? Do you know that's parenthetical, but it actually is very important because that phrase is a fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus had to come from a certain lineage. He had to come from a certain line. He had to come from the house of David. That's why in Matthew 1, that gives his genealogy and introduces that being the son of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them. In the end, the Bible says in another place that the Holy Spirit of God overshadowed her. She's there and an angel Gabriel comes and appears to her and says, Mary, you've been chosen of God. You're a chosen vessel. And God the Father has decided to use you as the vehicle by which his son will come into the world. Mary's stunned by this. How can this be? She ponders these things. How, how can these things be? And she goes to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. She says, Elizabeth, I'm, I'm pregnant. I've never known a man. Joseph and I are just engaged. I'm pregnant. And the baby that I carry is the Son of God. And the Bible says that John the Baptist is still in his mother's womb leaps for joy with the birth of the Christ child. I know this is a hard word to swallow this morning and I'm going to have a hard time getting it through to you. Because 2020 has been a terrible year. 
I stood up here in January of this year after the terrible year we went through last year by having so many of our church members pass away. I stood up here in January last year, this year and said 2020 has got to be better than 2019. What a liar I was. And it's really, really hard right now for a lot of people to find joy. But can I tell you this? <laughs> we should still leap for joy because Jesus came. If you think the world looks hopeless now, what would it look like without Him? Leap for joy. In the same country there were shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings. The word good tidings, euangelion, it's the same word we, we, we change it, we translate it in other places in the, in the Bible to the gospel. I bring you the gospel. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be, somebody say amen, to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. Can I show you this? I always try to point this out. Unto you in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The definite article there on a Savior means you need to read it specifically. It doesn't mean he's one of many saviors. It means he's the only Savior. For born unto you this day in the city of David is the only Savior there ever has been or ever will be. For born unto you this day in the city of David is a Savior. And what is his name? Christ the Lord. Can I show you something else? Look up here at me. I'm going real easy this morning. I've been keeping y'all for an hour and longer during sermon time, so I'm trying to back off a little bit. At least today, next week, you're getting two hours. The angels appeared to shepherds. If you're going to announce the birth of a king, you'd go to a palace. They didn't. If you want to announce the birth of a prince, you'd blow a trumpet and make a royal announcement. You'd shut down the kingdom and have everyone come out into the street for a parade. He didn't do any of that. He found some poor, dirty shepherds out in a field with some less than intelligent sheep. And the whole horizon lit up said, glory to God, the Savior's born. I want to say something that's very important. There's a lot of misconceptions about Christmas and there's a lot of misconceptions about church. And I've tried to break these down since I've been your pastor and I'm going to continue to try to break them down. Church ain't for perfect people. Church ain't for just rich people. Church ain't for sinless people. Church is for anybody who wants to come. Christmas. Jesus didn't come for some people. He came for all people. So whether you have a thousand dollar suit or a three dollar special, Jesus came for you. Whether you live in the high rent district or government housing, Jesus came for you. Whether you're the smartest person in your class, you, may, you graduated magna cum laude. Or you're a dummy and you graduated thank you laude. Jesus came for you. All these people who put up all these reasons and excuses and insecurities about why they can't come to Jesus and why, why they can't know Jesus and why, why they can't be a part of the church. I, I got news for you. Jesus was born into a poor family and the angels announced that to poor people. It's very simple. For born unto you this day in the city of David is a Savior. And that Savior came for all people. Friend, if only the rich got in, I'd be out. If only the smart got in, I'd be out. If only the handsome got in, I'd be out. Don't you say amen. But thank God, he said, Whosoever shall call upon my name, you can be saved and come to the Savior. 
It's a Christmas story. How Jesus came for all people. Look at what they say. I love this. This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. By the way, can I tell you something? We, I, I, we couldn't have our Christmas program, obviously, for obvious reasons. And our kids do such a sweet little job of depicting the, the nativity scene. Honestly, I've, I've sat under some great New Testament scholars in my day. I really have. Some, some of the leading people. Nobody knows exactly how all this played out. Some say he was born in a stable. Some say he was born in a hewn out rock in the side of a hill. Some say he was born on this day. We, we can't pinpoint all that exactly. And anybody tells you they can, they, they don't. It's just hard to know exactly how that worked. But here's what we know. However it was, wherever it was, whenever it was, when it happened, all of heaven rejoiced. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Isn't that amazing? There is no peace on the earth. Not yet. The world hadn't been peaceful since sin came in. I got news for you. It's not going to be peaceful until Jesus comes again. But isn't it amazing? Have you ever thought about that? I try to point out nuances of familiar passages that maybe you overlook or haven't paid any attention to. But with the birth of this baby, there's an announcement that peace has come. There's an announcement that peace has come. Which leads me to another point that I'd just like to make. And I hope I'm, I hope I'm preaching to somebody right now. And I hope this helps you. You know, uh, uh, you can still be at peace when the world is going crazy. Because peace is not the absence of a problem. Peace is the presence of the Lord. See, there's all kinds of problems that's going to happen after Jesus is born. They happen in his own life. I mean, before he's even out, before he's even out of diapers, they try to kill all the baby boys. His father, probably, his earthly father, his, his, I don't like to say his father in that way, but his earthly father, his caretaker, probably died when he was a child. Somewhere in his teen years. We don't know that for sure, but he's not mentioned after the trip to, to the temple where they lose track of him. Jesus is 12. Joseph's never mentioned again after that, and Jesus never mentions him again either. Probably died when Jesus was an adolescent. Everywhere he goes after he starts his ministry, he, he's popular as long as he's feeding people and giving free gifts to people. But when he starts preaching about hell, they start turning on him. His early ministry, he's got 5,000 people and men on a hillside and probably 10,000 altogether. And they're singing his praise because he's giving them fish sandwiches. But by the time he died, he only had one disciple that was willing to go to the cross with him. He had his share of problems. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But you know what? Even in the midst of that, he still brings peace. Peace. I can't explain this, and I hope that I'm making I hope I'm making a connection with someone this morning. But the world can be going to hell, but you can still have the peace of heaven if you know Christ. That's the message of Christmas 2020. The world's troubled. But Jesus still brings peace. And it came to pass that they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had seen and heard, as it was told unto them. I want to do something this morning, and I, I do this often, but I've never done it quite this way in this manner. 
And I feel impressed to do it for several reasons. But I'm going to conclude my sermon not with a bang, not with a, not with a tear-jerking story or anything like that. I want to conclude my sermon with a simple message. You ready? One day God looked down upon a vast nothingness and he said, I'm going to create. So he did. He spoke and he said, Earth, sun, moon, y'all hang right here. Stars, light the way. You know, a, a mountain would look good there. A lush field here. A stream there. Put some animals on it. Put some in the sky and call them birds and put some on the ground and give them four legs and let them walk. Pitch some in the water and teach them to swim without taking a breath. Do it. It was done. He said, that's great. Looks good. But something's missing. Give me some of that dirt. Man, be alive. Your living soul. You can't be like that. It's not meant for man to be alone. Go to sleep. Us men been napping ever since. Took a rib. Made a woman. Adam said, I'm good with that. Somehow, some way, a serpent sneaks his way into the garden. Snakes can get into awfulest places. He lied to that woman. And she believed him. She took that fruit and ate it and gave it to her husband, and he ate it. And from that point, Adam's ruined race fell into sin. then we had to do things we didn't want to do. God had to do things that he knew he would have to do, but it's unfortunate. He had to destroy and judge cities who did wrong. He had to choose out for himself a people that could continue on. And he knew, listen to me, I'll be done in just a minute. He knew when He made you, Brother Wes. He knew when He made you, Nathaniel, Tim. He knew when He made you that you would be a sinner and that He would have to save you. At least give you the option. So for about 4,000 years, man fights the law and the law wins. They shed more blood of more sheep and more goats than we could put on this in, in this state, in this, on this planet. Goat after goat, sheep after sheep, offer, altar after altar. But the Bible says the blood of sheep and goats would never satisfy. And finally, when man was at his wicked worst, and God had said, I'm done. No, I'm not. He spoke one more time. He said to his son, Go down there and die for those people. He said, I'll do it. Now go with me. Stay with me. The one who made it all 
The man who, the one who can tell angels to sing and they sing and tell clouds to form and they form and tell the earth to turn and turn and tell the stars to shine and they shine. That one became so helpless that he had to nurse at his mama's breast to survive. That he had to be rocked to sleep at night. The one who made it all had to be taught to walk and run and play. Never committed a sin. Never made a mistake, a misstatement or a misstep. When he's 30 years old, he leaves his house, he leaves his mother and father's house, and he goes out into Capernaum and all of Judea, and he begins to preach this gospel of the kingdom, and men begin to turn on him and mock him and accuse him, and eventually, listen to me, I want you to listen to me, eventually he's charged and tried and killed by his own people. And that baby who laid in a manger now lays in a tomb and they close the lid. If that were the end of the story, there would be no Christmas. But friend, he might not have could have walked out of that manger, but he walked out of that tomb. <laughs> and he's alive. Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the hook. Here's the sinker. Here's the one that finishes the deal. He did all that as a gift for you, for by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. He did that as a gift for you. And here's the deal. The, 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 to me, this is just magnificent. He doesn't ask you to do anything other than to believe that. Believe that. I don't mean know it. I mean believe it. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Christmas is a lot of, about a lot of things. We got lists and we got wants and we got wrapping paper and we got tape and we got trees and we got lights and we got Christmas carols and family gatherings and all that. But can I just say this to you? And I, hope, I don't care if you're a, uh, six months old or 96 years old. Christmas is about Jesus coming to save your soul. It's about it. Who celebrates the birthday of somebody they don't know? Whoever lives six doors down, whoever that is down here, I don't know who they are. Guess what? They don't get a birthday present from me. You know why? Because I don't know them. Guess what? I don't get one from them either. Listen to me. If you celebrate his birthday, you ought to know him. You ought to know him. And you can know him. Join me standing as we pray. Lord, thank you that you allow us to come today. And thank you for the Christmas season. And Lord, if there's anyone in the building that's never trusted Christ as Savior, if they would pray in faith believing, truly believe, and just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe you died on the cross and rose again for me. Come into my heart, Lord, and save me. Help me to live for you. And whether I die or you return, it matters not. You save me, I'll go to heaven. Thank you, Lord, for that promise. Lord, we thank you that we can worship today and we thank you for the time of year that it is and I pray that you'd bless all of our households at this Christmas season. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Jesse, you want to come? Jesse's going to play for us. Can I get a couple of fellas to help me with the offering?